Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me, Tim. Thanks for being here. I thank you all in advance for being so liberal with your patience and attention. Uh, yeah, so this is a plea regarding liberal, and the plea is based on a supposition that might cause some people discomfort, uh, namely that progressive or leftist political beliefs, generally speaking, are wrong-headed. I don't make this supposition to make anyone uncomfortable. I make this plea in the belief that uh, the effort serves universal benevolence given the situation in which we find ourselves and any protestations of that supposition will be welcome during Q&A. So I offer an olive branch. Um, the piece was published here um, by the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and it's really addressed to conservatives and libertarians Folks like these, whom I, am, I admire, and by the way, hearing Tim talk before today, I should have put your picture up here, um, who, who do tend to call progressive and left and capital D Democrat beliefs liberal. And I'm asking them not to do so and to instead use, for example, those other terms. Um, I know that these terms aren't all exactly the same, and I know that liberal is... Uh, used for a reason, and it's code very often for capital D Democrat, and there's reasons that people talk in codes, so I understand that there's a challenge, um, but there are still clever ways, subtle ways, such as using so-called liberal or liberals in quotation marks, maybe just adding left liberal, to actually um, basically stop calling these people liberal uh, and move away from that. Now, the folks who do that um, I just want to point out that I'm asking them not to call leftists liberals. I'm not going further and saying stop calling yourself conservative or libertarian. Um, I'm not so eager for that further move. Option C, I'm, I'm really just calling here for option B, which I actually think is quite significant. I know it sounds bizarre, but I'm, I'm here to make the case that this, is, this semantic issue is actually quite si significant. Um, I developed a statement regarding this, and Kevin Fry and I made this website, and uh, four or 500 people have signed it. Here are some of the UK signers, just a selection. Here are some of the US more libertarianish signers. Uh, here are some more US libertarianish signers. Here's Jonathan Haidt, he signed it, I'm not sure how to classify him. Um, here are some GMU signers. <clears throat> and also, just as the journal itself that this was published in is, is from a, a, a conservative organization, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, um, I'm, I'm, I think it's kind of natural that some of the libertarians and classical liberals would be sympathetic to what I'm saying, but there's also some warmth coming from the conservatives as well. Um, Charles Murray you might think of as more libertarian, but Amity Schles, Alan Charles Kaur, Steve Hayward. These two guys uh, are also practicing and advocating what I'm advocating, although they didn't sign that thing. Um, Charles Cook in his book, and also he commented on my piece and totally, totally agreed with what I was saying. Kevin Williamson has written similarly. Now, communications technology, I think, makes this plea more relevant, and it also greatly enhances uh, one's ability to mount a case for this. Um, we can communicate much more than we could in the past with, for example, Aussies or Czechs or Guatemalans, folks who would use the term more or less in its original sense, not in the North American, U.S. and Canadian sense. Um, not that it's just U.S. and Canadian, but it's principally and originally kind of, not, not originally, but that's the, the, the chief practicers of our way of talk, of the U.S. way of talking. So they, they mean, that, you know, they, they mean it in the old sense. And furthermore, some of these folks talk English more than they used to because of the way the world is changing. Um, but furthermore, you know, I think people naturally seek moral authority. And we might ask how well our, today, our institutions today answer the demand. Um, of course, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with academia and government and the media, maybe the churches. And I want you to think about communications technology as actually helping us to communicate with personalities of the past. 
I think in a lot of ways they do. And that also is in a way a kind of communication technology. And I think that's what, that's to some extent what we're doing here today. One tool in that are these n-grams. An n-gram is a string of words, a string of n words. For example, a three-gram is the Great War. And this simple plot here, which shows you the percentage of all three grams in millions of books that are the Great War, show that a war came, people called it the Great War, and then another war came and they stopped calling that other one the Great War. So <clears throat> just these very simple tools are so powerful in showing changes in semantic practice. And it's not hard to associate those very often with conceptual and cultural changes. <clears throat> Here's the United States are and have plural verbs, and then is and has. So you can see a couple decades after the Civil War, people began, a shift occurred where people referred to the United States as a single unified polity, a nation state, a single nation state. And I would suggest that this semantic change reflected cultural and conceptual change. So the word liberal, it's an old word, and this is only goes back to 1680 through 1769. Um, it was used for centuries. Um, Leo Strauss says liberal in the ancient sense or the old centuries long sense uh, meant becoming a free man is distinguished from a slave. So it was characteristic of the free man. Liberality is a virtue concerned with the use of wealth and therefore especially with giving. The liberal man gives gladly of his own in the right circumstances because it is noble to do so. Liberality is one aspect of human excellence or being honorable or decent. And this sense, this sort of pre-political sense, is reflected in Samuel Johnson's dictionary very nicely. Um, not mean, not low in birth, becoming a gentleman, munificent, generous, okay? And this uh, association with, the free, with what free men do and the virtues they cultivate are the basis for liberal arts, liberal sciences, liberal professions, which are just so deeply rooted. All of this is so deeply rooted in Western civilization. In fact, it is the crowning jewel, uh, uh, all this, of Western civilization. Um, so it's really, I think, a very important issue. And then suddenly the word was put to a political use and in a particular way. And the engrams just show it remarkably around 1770 Liberal principles, liberal policy, liberal system, liberal plan, liberal government started being used and being seized and used as a practice, becoming um, a word. And with respect to Britain here, there are sort of two perspectives on this inceptive meaning. One is the idea that Britain imported it from the rest of the of Europe, from the continent. And that has a long lineage. Um, even today, it's being repeated. But then there's Hayek's thesis. He said, it is often suggested that the term liberal derives from the early 19th century Spanish party of the liberales. I am more inclined to believe that it derives from the use of the term by Adam Smith in such passages as the liberal system of free exportation and free importation and allowing every man to pursue his own interest his own way upon the liberal plan of equality, liberty, and justice. And these tools, I think, show Hayek was right. Pretty just hands down clearly, um, and I'll show that here. I think you could maybe narrow the importation thesis, perhaps in certain ways, to salvage it to some extent, but basically Hayek was right. William Robertson deserves credit as the chief um, innovator here, so far as I can tell, and we have gone back, I'm working with Eric Hammer on, and others on this, and we have gone back, and I can confirm this, much of what I'm saying here quite well, um, and he started in his 1769 history of the reign of the Emperor Charles V, using liberal in this new way, which meant, you know, presumption of liberty, liberty, letting people pursue honest income, uh, and so on. 
Um, and he uses it repeatedly this way. He also uses it in a letter to Adam Smith in 1776. He also uses it in a book he subsequently published. So I really think he deserves credit for being the, re the first innovator of it all. And he was a big deal in his day, though very forgotten now. Uh, but Smith um, picks up on it and also very much uses it, exploits this new word. Uh, very clearly, it's in the wealth of nations. It's not in the other stuff, really. Um, so I want to highlight just two instances, in fact, the two Hayek hit upon. So here he's saying we're all nations to follow the liberal system of free trade. A great continent like Europe would be like a great free trade zone, and within that you wouldn't have famines and those extreme problems that we now sometimes have. And he explains this, and then he comes back and says, but very few countries have entirely adopted this liberal system. So he seems to be signaling, you know, there's an idea here and a policy here, a plan, and it deserves a name, and the name is liberal. And I think that also rings out in this important passage where he contrasts the view that looks at commerce and industry of a great country as though it were the separate departments of a public office, a kind of organizational view of the country's commerce and industry, which he attributes to Colbert, as opposed to allowing every man to pursue his own interest, his own way, upon the liberal plan of equality, liberty, and justice. So he's setting up a very broad, important contrast here between this kind of dirigiste interventionist idea and then this other idea. And what's the name of this other idea? The liberal plan. And the word is used elsewhere. I think those two are the two most significant moments, but there are other significant moments, and I'll just flip through these in case somebody wants to look at them another time. When he talks about the sovereigns with colonies and their policy toward their own colonies, he says they all have been illiberal and oppressive to some extent, but Britain the least so. And he repeats this idea, and in fact this exact phrase, illiberal and oppressive, twice. Okay, so it's not just Smith. This immediately gets picked up on and used, okay? Don't let the rewriters of history let us forget all this. See, these tools are helping us to remember it. I'm no great historical scholar, but these tools are so powerful that you know, even I can put some of this together. So in, a fit, in British officialdom, we see a lot of parliamentary discussion using the term this way. Even the king uses the term this way. And again, this is something that Eric and I are documenting and substantiating. And the Scots keep the ball rolling throughout. Dugald Stewart's an important figure in this. He's, a very, he's also largely forgotten. He's also a very big figure in his time. He was uh, the big deal in Edinburgh towards the end of Smith's life and then right after Smith's life for about two decades, two or three decades. And he keeps this ball rolling. In fact, it, in his account of Smith, he uses liberal, reinforcing this usage repeatedly. And he's very influential, for example, on all the folks who start the very influential Edinburgh Review, which starts in 1802. And again, we're tracking the, it, it here, and there's this consistent use of liberal in this political sense throughout, okay? And uh, for example, going up to McCulloch's 1824 essay on political economy in the Encyclopedia Britannica, he just goes wild using liberal this way. He seems to be on an absolute agenda to make this word the word for the Smithian general attitude towards policy. So just to look back again at the continent, um, there, it's really clear that they imported it from the Brits. First of all, these important central, these first works were, were translated in whole or in part rather early, plus people read some English, of course. And when we do the engrams in the other languages that we can do them in and do the same expressions, they come, but they all come later, a couple of decades later than the picture for English. France, Spain, Italy, and Germany, all the same. It comes, but it comes later. It's trailing. So they're importing it. And this is further confirmed if you look at the details of who's talking liberal in those countries. It's generally like Smithian types, like Say in France, or Hovellanos, 
who's a leader of the liberales in Spain, or Ad Laspara in Sweden. <clears throat> okay, so the word liberalism comes, of course, eventually, starting around the 1920s, the noun liberalism, and that obviously gets used in place of some of the other expressions, and it flowers into the liberal, the classical liberal movement and era that we associate with um, John Bright and William Gladstone and you know all the liberal philosophers and the Liberal Party in Britain, okay, which was a classical liberal party uh, until until the later when it transformed and ruled. You know, Gladstone was prime minister as the Liberal Party prime minister four times in Britain. Um, okay. So was liberty really the sole? Before moving forward, I just want to talk a little bit more this about, was it really the sole of original liberalism? And I want to address how liberal reform was achieved. <clears throat> and all of these guys indicate that Smith and company persuaded the aristocrats and elites. And this point figures into this question of what the soul of liberalism was. I just want to read these because this is new uh, uh, and, and worth putting out. By the end of his life, Smith had not only the satisfaction of seeing the opposition to his I policy ideas gradually subside, but to witness the practical influence of his writings on the commercial policy of his country. John Millar, perhaps Smith's favorite student and then professor at Glasgow, the world is much indebted to philosophers, especially Smith, the universal approbation which this new doctrine has met with in the higher classes of mercantile people is a decisive proof of the enlarged views of political economy by which the present age has become so eminently distinguished. Moving forward, but with the same kind of idea, Schumpeter, speaking of the English case in particular, so here he's talking about who ruled throughout this liberal period. The aristocratic element continued to rule the roost right to the end of the period of intact and vital capitalism, by which he would mean through the 19th century. The aristocratic element made itself the representative of bourgeois interests and fought the battles of the bourgeoisie. It is hard to, it, I'm sorry, it had to surrender its last legal privileges but with these qualifications and for ends no longer its own, it continued to man the political engine to manage the state to govern. And Mises puts this idea most succinctly, the most amazing thing concerning the unprecedented change, and here he's referring to like the blade of the hockey stick, the most amazing thing concerning these unprecedented change is the fact that it was accomplished by a small number of authors and a hardly greater number of statesmen who had assimilated their teachings. Western civilization adopted capitalism upon recommendation of a small elite. Let me finish. That, this might be too strong, certainly, but there's an idea here that I just want to make use of. So you can think of, as liberal moves through time, sort of three faces of it. The presumption of liberty, as in Smith, democratism, by which I mean the expansion of political participation, expansion of the vote, um, maybe what um, Benjamin Constant called ancient liberty, and then um, the governmentalization of social affairs, the welfare state, the regulatory state, big state players in society and culture, just like we have today. And, you know, there's kind of a, an, an issue here of what is the soul of the original liberalism and how long does it remain the soul? And I'm making the case that number one was the soul with the Scots, with the original liberalism, and I believe to a great extent going further. Um, it mixed with two, to be sure. Um, and that gets mixed up in it. And those one and two are not necessarily, you know, this guy voting here with his little vote, that might say, you know, make Milton Friedman mayor, right? I mean, who knows what he's voting for? So it's not inherently anti, anti the presumption of liberty, uh, but then three is basically in tension with number one. And I think a lot of the impulse, psychological impulse, um, 
of two and three is in common, actually. So I think two slide, slid very much into three. So <clears throat> comparing the two, in Britain, after the early 18th century, um, the Glorious Revolution and the unions of the parliaments, it's a stable polity, a nation state with a stable government. On the continent, often, liberals felt the need to change the polity as such. They needed to get p lawmakers who were liberal in power. So they had to worry often more about two type issues. <clears throat> While the British authors are more focused on liberal policy reform within the stable polity. And Stewart makes a, quite a point of saying this about Smith, that he's about natural liberty and not democratism. The progress, he says, already made in this science has been sufficient to show that the happiness of mankind depends not on the share which the people possess directly or indirectly in the enactment of laws, but on the equity and expediency of the laws that are enacted. And he says, the most celebrated works of Smith and others have aimed at the improvement of society, not by delineating plans of new constitutions, but by enlightening the policy of actual legislators, elites and such. So was Smith a Democrat in the proper and narrow sense of that term? I'd say no, not particularly, okay? So going, going kind of forward, so, Liberalism changed, and there was like a sudden, a sudden collapse in it. Uh, one Fabian wrote, writer wrote, laissez-faire individuous political philosophy is dead. In vain does poor Mr. Spencer endeavor to stem the torrent. His political ideas are already as antiquated as Noah's Ark. I do not know a single one of the younger men in England who is influenced by them in the slightest degree. Though, the, though one hears of one occasionally, just as one hears of a freak in a dime museum. And this captures something very colorfully, which is very well borne out by a lot of historical literature, that there was a generational collapse that around 1800, um, I'm sorry, 1900, say, the younger people would, almost none were being raised up as liberal and taking to liberalism. So you have, moving through time, young people devoid of liberal in the original sense, and then older people who are still, you know, editors of magazines and, you know, play roles in society, kind of keeping them in check, but gradually those people fall away, and then the, the new philosophy uh, just comes to dominate. Now, why did it decline so suddenly? Some say because it failed, such as Karl Polanyi. I think there are other explanations, but I can't go into them here. The point is, is that it did, and that we see quite remarkably with these tools, I think, the, 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 the growing, sudden, and systematic mentality of governmentalization. I mean, terms that both reflect this mentality and that advance it. It's quite astonishing that none of these words, this, this is really something that we should scream from the rooftops, none of these words before about 1890 had any currency. Social justice, economic justice, equal opportunity, which is a term I've never liked, frankly. Economic equality, equality of opportunity, democratic ideals, okay? These are all new concepts reflecting this change. And then of course the governmental institutions come um, in droves and you see language reflecting that. <clears throat> and perhaps most importantly and tragically, the core words of Western civilization lose or change meaning. Liberal being one of the most important of those, um, reflected in the changing character of the Liberal Party in Britain um, and the new liberalism of, of these guys that were pictured here, like Thomas Hill Green, Hobhouse, Hobson, many, many, many others, who aggressively said, we have a new liberalism that's different from the old liberalism. Um, and Ryan Dawes and I have put together long compendia of quotations for all of these, for 10 different words, um, showing the new usages, and then also showing people reacting, usually negatively, to these new usages. 
So it was a very clear cultural change that's going on in a very systematic way that's very, very poorly understood today. No one picture captures this change better than this one, that people felt the need to now distinguish between new liberalism and old liberalism. And there it is, and the timing is just, as I say. So what am I telling, asking these people to do? I'm asking them to refer to uh, the left, progressives, Democrats, social Democrats, with other terms. And I just want to quickly say that these other terms don't pose anything like the problems with that liberal do. I mean, I'm not. I'm fine with calling them left, for example. It's never meant classical liberal. It's very, very much a 20th century term. Okay, that's, that's, so that's no confusion there. They can have it. Um, progressive, I feel the same way. It's also a new 20th century term. Uh, and um, it's always meant governmentalization. Um, here's H.L. Mencken in 1926. The progressive is one who is in favor of more taxes instead of less, more bureaus and job holders, more paternalism and meddling, more regulation of private affairs, and less liberty. I think that well captures it, that fact that progressivism had rich veins of eugenics and racism and all around statism is, is, is well known, although not as well known as it should be. Furthermore, the whole idea of progress, I think, is very goal-oriented. Um, are you making progress on your term paper? And for a polity, the whole idea of the polity having a goal, a shared common goal of such kind, is, I think, in itself kind of illiberal. And so I see liberalism as a philosophy of improvement or betterment and not progress. So I wouldn't let that reservation keep you from, would, from, from using pr progressive. Social democratic is a very European term. It's essentially a term that came into f use in flavor, or favor when, as, as kind of like the, 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 instead of democratic socialism. When democratic socialism became sounding too much like pro-socialism, the kind of like the, 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 the left liberal cousin then was, was social democratic. And generally speaking in Europe, it has this you know, gov tendency towards governmentalization flavor, just like I'd say the Democratic Party generally does. I'm not saying on every issue, I understand the fine points there, but generally does here. <clears throat> and since America is becoming more like Europe, okay, to some extent even willfully so, and since we're talking more with Europe, I think this is a good term to make more use of. So the word liberal connotes generous, noble, open-minded. It connotes learning and invention. It always has, as in the liberal arts, liberal sciences, liberal professions. It obviously relates to liberty. It's the name that emerged for the crown jewel of human history, the presumption of liberty. And in most, much of the world, let's say, if not most of the surface of the earth, it still means that, pretty much. And even in the US and Canada, the term still betrays its provenance in words like liberalize and liberalization, okay? So to oppose liberals or liberalism is like opposing modern open society. And indeed, when we look around the world and see the most oppressive and terrible regimes, e even a lot of the people who, who I'm trying to address here we'll call those societies illiberal or against liberal society. So for these reasons, we have, well, you know, I think that um, calling the left liberal has been a gift that ki keeps on giving. It's a great advantage and benefit to be called the liberal. Um, and I think it's one of the great reasons why um, enlightened ideas haven't fared better in our world. Thank you for your attention. 20, 28 minutes. <laughs>